today I'm here with my mom. Hi. <laughs> um, a little bit of a different episode today. Uh, we're actually going to be doing uh, like a little history deep dive, um, which I think will be really cool. Um, Yay. Yeah. But anyway, how have you been? I've been good. That's good. It's almost spring. It's almost spring. Well, I mean, technically it is. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would like it to consistently stay warm because it's been nice for like a little while, but I just don't want it to start snowing again. Because we had snow. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. Um, yeah. Um, to, to do the obligatory Rainy Tuesdays, like talking about movies um, mm-hmm. and like not you know of course not history um we did just watch uh west side story together, yes uh the steven spielberg one that was so good I, it, it was amazing it was beautiful i mean i i was one of those skeptical people because uh-huh. you know why remake a, a classic a classic movie mm-hmm. but this was i mean it was gorgeous gorgeous yeah I mean, everything I came together the dancing the the music yeah. the supposedly um, staging yeah, supposedly Ansel, what's his face? Like the guy who played Tony. I don't, yeah. Supposedly like, the actor is like not a good guy. I don't really know what he did. He's just he's got like scandals around him. Um, I don't know. But he had a good voice. He did. Um, so like, I saw an interview this morning that Spielberg said that he wasn't going to do another one, which made it very was he wasn't going to like do another musical kind of thing. This was his but one meant, and like, done. A sequel to West Side Story. I was no. Like, Why would he? <laughs> no. No. It's like, everybody died. Oh wait. Yeah. There's <laughs> the more. sequel. <laughs> yeah. Um. No, they they put in some like interesting representation, like mm-hmm. LGBTQ, um, which was very cool to mm-hmm. see, kind of. Well, they did it seamlessly. They didn't do, like, a big neon sign saying, um, you know, here's how diverse we are. Right. They they did it more um, just naturally part of the story. Yeah. Which I think is the best kind. Mm -hmm. Like, that, I mean, it was wonderfully done. Um, And. Like, every film was placed. And Rita Marina. Yes. Very cool. That made me so happy. Mm -hmm. Because she's, I mean, she's an icon. Yep. And Especially for West Side Story. For well, beginning with West Side Story, but mm-hmm. all her career, she's yeah. what is, she's an egot. Oh yeah. So, mm-hmm. you know, she's won every kind of award there was, and yeah. then for her to get a, you know, like a featured song no, was, was really just good. really cool. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, it was very very fun. Um, what was your favorite musical number? Oh gosh. I mean, Tonight is one of the best songs that exist in the world, Mm -hmm. but I think for sheer energy, America. I was going to say, like, there's a clear answer. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Um, Like, it was just so well choreographed, just so well shot. Like, Mm -hmm. all of it was just beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that was... That was just glorious. Mm-hmm. And I like the way that they brought it onto the streets because in the original, it had always been up on the the rooftops. Yeah. And the way they brought it into the city was just... Very neat. It, it amped up the energy, I think. I think so, too. Yeah. it. I mean, like, it was just a beautiful movie to watch. And, like, um, the colors are so vibrant in it. Which, mm-hmm. truly, like, for a musical, I think it needs, um, like... I, I know there was a lot of, um, like, oh, okay, so we are recording this in our living room, and uh, our cat, who I talk about all the time on the podcast, may put in an appearance, might pop in, you can kind of see his ears in frame right now, <laughs> um, but, yeah. um, he'll think about it, um, but I know that, like, another musical that came out, uh, last year, that got people talking was Dear Evan Hansen. Mm-hmm. And I know the Quindies. subject matter of that movie is dark. Right. Um, but the like cinematography of it and like the lighting of it was just so, so incredibly dark that it just like took away any moments of humor in that musical Mm -hmm. of which it's supposed to be like a comedy about a really dark subject right but but i think that i you know i think that's one of the things that you have happen in somebody who's trying to do like 
bring it from the stage where you've got yeah. all that extra atmosphere yeah. to to a theater mm-hmm. or to a movie screen. Sometimes they're like, well, if we if we keep it all moody and everything, and that drives me crazy. I just think it's never been the right call for any movie no. musical ever. Like, I think you have to have, like, bright colors for a movie musical. I don't... Maybe not even bright, but but you have to have the light in. I mean, it can be dark. Sure. You know, it, it can be, all, you know, everybody can go around in darkness, but you've got to have that light surrounding it to give it life. Be, to give it life. Yeah. I mean, you have to have the outlines of the shadows, basically, I yeah. think. I think that's fair. I don't know. Just, like, I think that even for darker, like, stage plays and everything, mm-hmm. like... The, like, set design, the lighting, the sound, like, all Mm -hmm. of that has so much, like, to play in it. And I think with movies, like, the problem with lighting for, like, uh, that kind of connection is that it's, like, um, movies are typically lit to be, like, you're watching real life. Right. Um, But you don't want that when you're watching a musical. You want theatrical like environment. I get that point. Yeah. You know, but I don't even like it in like when you're doing the real life movies. I mean, you know, I watch sure. a lot of history like Yeah, you watch like the saddest things ever. <laughs> uh, like... and, and so but when they do that lighting when they're like, Okay, it's dark and, and we're all depressed and you can't see the characters' faces yeah. or their eyes or I'm just like Right. What's the point? Right. Um well, so. speaking of historical movies, um, <laughs> speaking of, this guy would be great. <laughs> um, you have a, a guy in history that you like a lot. Yes, um, I do, and you're here to I talk have, about him. I have many of them. We could like do a whole series of guys in history that I think are the, just the coolest. <laughs> um, um. Yeah. So here's. The first. The first one. We're going to talk about Henry A. Wallace. The A stands for Aggard, which... Silly name. Makes him sound like a Star Wars character a little bit. Kind of, yeah. Yeah. But, okay, so the guys that I like in history tend to have this whole, like, theme. Mm -hmm. It's like my theme in life. You've heard my my philosophy a billion times is the E.B. White, you know, from Strunk and White and Charlotte's Web and stuff. Sure. Uh, He has a phrase in one of his essays that says, I get up in the morning um, torn between a desire to save the world and have a hell of a good time. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that makes planning my day difficult. Right. And that's, that's like my favorite saying. Yeah. Well, Henry Wallace, I came across one of his that says, if I were to draw any conclusions from life so far, I would say that the purpose of existence here on earth is to improve the quality and abundance of joyous living. I like it. Yeah, I mean, I just think this is cool. Yeah. Um, Now, Henry, um, you know, I know how you feel about Iowa and Nothing against corn. Iowa. I don't like corn. I know you don't like corn, mm-hmm. so we're going to start sort of with corn. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> start at the bottom so that way he seems cooler. As yes, on. exactly. I get it. Um, well, Henry Wallace was part of, like, the Wallace family of Iowa. Right. He was born um, October 7th, 1888. Mm-hmm. And he came into the world sort of as the third generation of the Wallaces of Iowa. Mm-hmm. And he, um, his grandpa yeah. was called Uncle Henry mm-hmm. by the entire state. That's fun. Yeah. And he was like the guy that he had, he ran a newspaper and he was like the guy that people wrote to with like, you know, dear Uncle Henry, my corn won't grow. Mm-hmm. And, he, you know, Uncle Henry. He's like the corn whisperer. The corn whisperer <laughs> kind of guy. And so he put, he would keep like. He would do a newspaper about like farm prices and what was growing and what was good and stuff like that. Yeah. And everybody like really got into him. And so like when the progressive movement came along Mm -hmm. back in the uh, or the populist movement in the early 20th century. Yeah. They wanted him to be a part of it. But 
it was all he did not like it like the whole williams jennings bryan and all this kind of stuff with people screaming and yelling about stuff yeah he thought it was entirely too um what was the word he used um he thought it was too melodramatic and thought that education was the only thing that would propel people forward right so then his son of course becomes a professor Mm -hmm. and this is henry c and then he goes on to be secretary of agriculture under warring harding so his, his family's like really connected to this yeah so while he was a professor um, his um, Henry was born, mm-hmm. and they grew up at the college. And one of Henry's early influences was um, Grover. Uh, okay, music in my head. George Washington Carver. Okay, who um, told him that there was three ways to grow. That any problem you had had a three part solution. Okay, yourself, the problem, and your maker. Mm-hmm. And so that was kind of Henry, how Henry started out. Yeah. And so he would work in the fields because when, uh, you know, I mean, we could go a whole sidetrack on George Washington Carver and how he was so much more than peanuts. Right. But so he's sitting there doing experimental agriculture yeah. at like eight, nine, ten years old. Mm-hmm. So he is amazing. Right. You know, so we start off with, with that premise. Yeah. <laughs> and um, the... The overall picture of him that we're going to talk about is he was a farmer, Mm -hmm. an academic, a progressive, and he had this huge belief in American democracy. Right. Um, When I described him to somebody earlier, I said he's kind of like Bernie before Bernie. Mm -hmm. And so we're going to talk about that that kind of thing because he has this background where he grows up when he's... um, He's editor of the paper after he goes to college. And while he's in college, he starts noticing that, like, corn... We're going to talk about corn now. Yeah. I'm sorry. That's fine. Um, corn yields were going down. Yeah. And people weren't getting good product. Mm-hmm. So he, scientifically, started creating hybrid corn. Right. Now, he, he's the one who created um, hybrid... As someone who doesn't like corn... Mm-hmm. What is hybrid corn? Because that hybrid like corn, corn times corn, and that's too much corn. It's kind of corn times corn. Yes. But do you remember the whole like um, Punnett squares and stuff when when you did um, science yeah. in school? Mm-hmm. It's kind of that. Mm-hmm. They start mixing different kinds of corn okay. to create a hybrid that is hardy and that the strongest corn, disease resistant right. and bug resistant and all that kind of stuff. Uh huh. He succeeds so well that hybrid corn, uh, under his stuff, his pioneer hybrid, and it's like H-Y-B-R-E-D, okay. becomes like the biggest in the country. Mm. And in fact, it was just like in the 1990s, it was bought by DuPont. Oh, wow. And okay. so it's still, I mean, it made him a fortune and right. it was like, like still going, still going. Right. and it's, it's like the big, big deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, as much as I love him, there's a little part of me that whispers every time I do that, you know, Masanto, Masanto, oh, he God. started that, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm sorry. but, um, but at the same time, it was this, his idea that agriculture would bears the brunt of a lot of the economy. Right. And so he was like, you know, how can I make it better? Mm-hmm. So, um, that, that would be enough uh-huh. for somebody to have a legacy. Sure. Yeah. I, I mean, especially in the Midwest. Uh, and as much as I hate to admit it, this is a, a two thirds Midwest podcast. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. this would this would be a big deal to have a leg- legacy for that. Right. But he is also known as the father of soil conservation, yeah. the father of rural electrification. Mm-hmm. Um, he pioneered the use of weather forecasting. Okay. And what was his weather forecasting I, method? 
Um, he would grab it, you know, from the different, he started, you know, really uh, using meteorologists. Okay. And they started doing weather forecasting, long range and everything for the farmers. So it wasn't like the Southern Wives Tale thing of like no. a rock on a string? No, or woolly, <laughs> uh, woolly worms yeah. and things like that. He was actually using scientific gotcha. methods. Yeah. And then the other thing is he started using um, economic agricultural statistics. Yeah. And so, you know... Farmers could track how, you know, what usage, you know, if you put this much into wheat and this much into corn and this much into stuff like that, you would end up with better yields. So question, um, because I know you mentioned the newsletter and was that just his grandfather? Did he continue? The newsletter? He continued. He was editor of it for yeah. like 10 years, I think. Okay. Because I was wondering, uh, like, you know, obviously this is pre-internet and right so it's like how did he tell all of the farmers all of these things the newsletter still continues it's oh, wow. it, it got bought out but mm -hmm. um it still continues as a name in one of the that's very cool. online published newsletters so yeah. it's um you know he had it's still you know mm -hmm. all of this stuff contributes yeah he's still going he's still going um and and we'll get to like we're going to move him into politics. He didn't like sure. politics at first. That's the best kind of person. Yeah, he really... To be in politics, though. Yeah, he really didn't like it because he also, he thought it kind of had killed his father. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, he thought Herbert Hoover killed his father. <laughs> Not on purpose. There's a conspiracy theory. <laughs> <laughs> Not on purpose. Herbert Hoover himself. <laughs> and a hitman specifically for his father. Exactly. But, but his father was another person who was a strong advocate of agriculture. Yeah. And in the years leading up to the Great Depression, mm -hmm. he kept saying, things are going, this, you know, this isn't going to last. Sure. Because the farmers, history side note, yeah, the Great Depression that we know of that started in 1929, uh -huh. it was hitting the farmers almost earlier. 10 years earlier. Mm -hmm. And so his father was like, yeah, frantically. Frantically warning. saying, you know, red flag, red flag. Yeah. But Hoover and Harding and Calvin Coolidge mm -hmm. um, were all like, the market will take care of it. Sure. Market, market, market. Right. And, you know, and so his father is trying to do this and then gets, you know, like gets pneumonia and then dies. And, Naturally. And so, you know, Henry A, because you can't, you, all of them are Henry so, I hate that. <laughs> Thank you so much for not naming me your name. I think that is the stupidest. Well, well you ought to see the Roberts in our family. Oh God. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so it's Henry, Uncle Henry, uh -huh. Henry C, okay. and then Henry A. Okay. So Henry A is our Henry guy. Henry A is like the topic of this podcast. Yeah. Henry A is the topic of this podcast. Yeah. Podcast. So Henry C though was involved in politics as well. In politics as well. Uh-huh. So. And was killed by Herbert Hoover. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do not go away from this podcast thinking that is a true thing. It is a fact. <laughs> you heard it here first. It is. Just kidding, you heard it from Henry A first, but <laughs> quoting Henry A. <laughs> he, he just did not have a good feeling about Hoover. Sure. But, well, that's important as we go along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, so uh, I'm gonna jump just a bit ahead because um, before we get into the meat of the thing, over the course of his life, he authored more than 16 books. Very impressive. Um, he was given um, um, honorary doctorates mm -hmm. at like all these different universities, including Harvard. In 1935. Okay. Which is really cool because the class, the 1935 class of honorary doctorates yeah. included Thomas Mann, the guy who wrote Magic Mountain. Okay. And Albert Einstein. Sure. And I mean, like, there's a group photo of, uh, you know, right. of Henry and all these, like... Impressive. Impressive, yeah. you know, like, world leaders that sure. you've all heard of. Uh -huh. And so, I like that. Knowing, you know, Henry's right in there in the middle of it. Definitely, yeah. So, um, so anyway, one of the things that happens mm -hmm. is that, of course, we have 
1930 or 1929 depression begins yeah and hoover's not really good at negotiating his way out of that because his hoover was a great man he did a lot of good things like he is considered he did kill this man's father (laughs) (laughs) when he wasn't murdering right uh secretaries of agriculture he um in his spare time in his before he was president (laughs) he was known as the guy that rescued europe after world war one that's why why was he known as that because he set up all these charity things okay and all these people who'd been displaced and you know like france was like one big battlefield. Right. And he he went out and raised charity, said that all these displaced persons had food and shelter and clothing and things like that. Yeah. So he was he was a really, you know, a good man. The fact that when nineteen twenty nine happened, he just froze. Yeah. And didn't do anything mm-hmm. has tarnished him forever. Mm-hmm. But Yeah. Do you think it was like a shock to people or do you think they were just like, like, obviously, you know, we see people in modern politics and like their responses to significant world events. Um, yeah. And like, we, I don't know if the reaction is ever like shocked so much as just like, you yeah, know, fucking of course, like, God, this idiot. Or like, was, so was it like the same public reaction or was it more like, Really? We thought, like, you'd have this. Like, we thought you'd have uh, I think a lot of people thought he'd have this. Yeah. And his idea was, well, you know, the market will correct, the market will correct, okay. the market will correct. We don't need to, you yeah. know, we need to keep all these, the, you know, the tariffs and the, the, the overproduction. Think about it this way, uh, because this is one of the things that comes up early in, even before 29, mm-hmm. is think about, like, the farmer's, in like World War One, mm-hmm. they're having to produce this huge amount of crops to feed all the soldiers and feed all the, fe- and then you know then after nineteen nineteen you know dead soldiers everybody dead from the Spanish flu sure you know and then all of a sudden agriculture goes down like this right and but at the same time they're still trying to produce the same amount they did yeah and they don't have any price yeah they don't have any you know so. And there's no response from Washington other than, if we keep doing what we're doing, it'll correct. Yeah. And so, of course, FDR comes in. Uh Uh-huh. And, um, yeah, you know, happy days are here. And I'm not going to actually sing because it would terrify people who listen. Also copyright. Yeah. Um, I think that's out of copyright Well, then never mind. Sing to your... Like I said... (laughs) Causing people pain is not a thing I do. (laughs) Anyway, so he comes into office. Yeah. And when he builds his cabinet, there are only two true progressives Uh on the cabinet. They are. And they're Henry Uh as Secretary of Agriculture. Uh Uh-huh. And Frances Perkins. Okay. Um, You've heard of her? Yeah. First female cabinet secretary, labor secretary. Yeah. Just incredible. Mm Mm-hmm. Everybody else is sort of, you know, your mainstream politician kind of thing. But FDR wanted to try some new ideas. Yeah. And the biggest thing about that is the the tenets of the um, New Deal mm-hmm. were relief, or the three R's, relief, recovery, and reform. Okay. So basically what they wanted to do is... Um, you know, make sure they took care of the people that were already hurting. Mm-hmm. Um, start projects that would cause, like, some sort of recovery. Yeah. And then, finally, um, do something that would change the system. Okay. To make it so that this wouldn't happen again. Uh-huh. And so, one of the first avenues was the Agricultural Adjustment Act. Okay. Because you have to understand farmers... Um, when the country started, mm-hmm. um, the farmers were 90% of the labor force. Okay. By the end of the um, Depression, by the time we're getting ready to go into World War II in 1940, yeah. farmers were only like 18% of the Jesus uh, Christ. Yeah. That's, yeah. So, 
urbanization has been happening uh-huh. over, you know, the so so hundred years. In yeah. that short decade, like, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, well, I mean, this is 1790 to, to 1940. Just kidding. I thought you said a different start time. Yeah. I you said right before Well, the 3% dropped in, um, from 1930 to 1940 was 21%. Okay. And that is significant. That is significant. I thought that you were is. saying the, the 90 was at the beginning of the Depression and at the end of the Depression was 17. It was like, that's insane. Yeah, it 3% was. 3% is still crazy, but it is not. As no, crazy. As crazy. Right. As kind of a flip. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, as Ag, um, Okay, a lot of people say that he is the only genius to have ever served as the person in charge of the Agricultural Department at the USDA. Okay. Uh, And I would believe it. He's got a couple of flaws that make it hard for that to be recognized. Sure. But one of the things you have to understand that in 1933, the highest unemployment Mm -hmm. because of the Depression was 24%. Okay. Well, 24.9%. So, so 20, yeah, a, one in four people were out of a job. Right. So not only is this affecting the farmers mm-hmm. uh, and the fact that they're not, they don't have any money, but they can't Just sell everyone. anything. Right, yeah. Because, I mean. People can't buy it. People can't buy it. Yeah. For the whole part of the Depression, it stayed like 14%. Okay. So it was big unemployment. Yeah. And the foreclosure rate Mm -hmm. um, was more than 1% for the whole of the Depression. Like, any one day, they said, um, in 1933, at the beginning of the Depression, about 1,000 homes a day were being foreclosed on. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine that. Yeah. I mean, it's like the pandemic times 100. Right. It was just awful. Mm Mm-hmm. So there's three parts of the Agricultural Act that um, Henry plays significant okay. role in. First of all, it's the Dust Bowl. Dust Bowl, okay. You've heard of the Dust Bowl? Yes. Okay, the Dust Bowl was was ginormous. Mm-hmm. And if you look at it, um, it left two million people homeless. Right. It went all the way from Washington, D.C. DC to Sydney, Australia. Uh-huh. More than a hundred million acres mm-hmm. were affected. Christ, yeah. And you know, people in in DC were like, "What? What? You know, what? Do? Why should we pass relief efforts on? You know, right? In the Midwest for yeah. the farmers, you know, the Dust Bowl was so bad that one day in nineteen um, thirty five, okay, Hugh Bennett, who was one of uh, the aides was trying to explain why they needed the recovery act. And they're like, he's getting pushed back to like, you know, all Senate hearings. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've watched, like they started the Katanji Brown ones today. Gotcha. Okay. And so, you know, we like to make speeches. Right. <laughs> so they're sitting there making speeches and stuff like that. And they're like, well, why, why do we need it? Hugh opens the window and you see the dust cloud. You see the dust from Oklahoma and all Nebraska yeah. sweeping across the Washington sky. Yeah. Paid actor. Yeah. <laughs> and you see, and they passed it the next day. Good, yeah. So, um. I like that, like, dramatic little flair. Yeah. Like, this is why. Yeah, gentlemen, this is what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, the yeah. Magical. yeah. But the problem was, one of the things, when they're talking about the recovery, one of the things that they did there is they started putting in, like, soil conservation plans. Okay. And the idea of, of topsoil and of not, you know, overplanting and things like that, which yeah. was part of the USDA planning. Mm-hmm. Um in this golden age of the USDA with, you know, Henry. Yeah. And then the next one is the CCC. Okay. You know what the CCC is? A Civilian Conservation Corps. Okay. Uh, and that you've seen in action. Look at me go. When? Um, Gettysburg. Okay. Like all the little uh, rest stations and some of the paths and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They were done. And they fight casinos. <laughs> yeah. 
Exactly. All of those things that were built, the old like walkways with the, yeah. the rocks and things, mm-hmm. were built by workers from the CCC. Okay, very interesting. Um, this was a plan. Um, when did the CCC start? In 1933. Okay. And it was one of those plans. FDR had tried it in New York when he was governor mm-hmm. on a small scale. baby beast yeah. scale. But what this did is it, it gave people jobs. Right. And then they had them go out. Over three billion trees were planted. Okay. It was the greatest reforestation effort yeah. in U.S. history. Mm-hmm. Um, and so these guys, they had jobs. Yeah. They had a certain amount that they had to send home. And the mm-hmm. rest, of the, they you know had spending money. Mm-hmm. But it was camps. Yeah. Um, and they went out and they did, like, you know... All the all the like state parks and national parks and things like that that you see around yeah. have CCC features okay, very cool. that they built mm-hmm. and it was you know the, a, an army yeah and one of the things when the U S went into World War Two that mm-hmm. was one of the reasons they were able to mobilize so fast is because these guys were already used to um, you know military orders and things like that right and the other thing is it dropped literacy. Over 50, 57,000 people oh, wow. learned to read through as this? part of, through working for the CCC. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. And so it was, you know, it was an incredibly, incredibly helpful thing. Helpful yeah. plan. Um, yeah, they planted more than 3 billion trees and state and la- national uh, parks. Uh, more than 700 new state parks were built because of it. And what was Henry's involvement? Henry was Secretary of Agriculture. So he was like, so he was like one of the point people. Yeah. Um, it was some of other, uh, uh, like Hopkins, okay. Harry Hopkins and things like that were really into, into it. it. Yeah. Um, but that was, but Henry was nominally head of it. Right. And then the other thing that he created was the ERS, the Economic Research Service, okay. which was not really official as a, its own little department of USDA until 1961. Mm-hmm. But Henry is the one, like I said, he started keeping statistics and started looking at that and started yeah. looking at agriculture in a scientific way, uh-huh. which was a huge deal. Absolutely. yeah. And so, like I said, he was considered the only genius to ever be, uh, be that. Huh. Then comes 1940. Okay. Unprecedented. Yeah. FDR is going to run for a third term. Mm-hmm. He wanted a new kind of vice president. You know how like we fuss at vice presidents today being too involved, you know? Do we? Well, okay, like Dick Cheney or okay, or even Joe Biden when he was vice president. You give them more we to thought do. He was involved. <laughs> you go more to. <laughs> I thought okay. he was just good for memes. Like. <laughs> yeah. Well, the idea was that vice president went from being like a non-entity right. to it mattering. Uh-huh. And for a lot of people, 1940 is when that starts. That turning point. Okay. Is that turning point. Is when FDR chose Henry to be his vice president. Right. Instead of anybody else, he had had Garner and other people um, in his first two terms, but he didn't. He wanted he wanted Henry. Right. In fact, he wanted Henry so much that he told uh, the Democrat the nominating committee. Yeah. Um, Welcome, baby. There he is. I don't know if this is your podcast debut or not, but. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, he wanted Henry to be his running mate or he wouldn't run okay yeah i mean that's was so he wanted somebody who was going to take charge Mm -hmm. so henry had his own portfolio and he was really he was going to be eyes and ears yeah and this becomes important uh, because he also starts dealing with Latin American countries and things like that Mm -hmm. and becomes part of the war production board so he's trying to get people to to contribute and to be more involved, be in more involved. And one of his best things that he did mm-hmm. is he did, um, like when he was getting Latin American production ramped up for the war effort. Yeah. He made the companies who invested in Latin America for that. Mm-hmm. 
he made them promise not to pay them any less because they were Latin American countries. Very good, yeah. And in his diplomacy with them, 13 of the Latin American countries, you know, Central South America, dropped their alliances with the Axis. Oh, wow. And became supporters of the Allies. Yeah. So he was really, really big in that. Big in showing that, okay, we can work together. This is a whole Pan American yeah. um, effort. Yeah. Then, of course, he also does his thing that's going to come back and bite him in the ass. I can do that. You can do that. <laughs> okay, that's going to come back and bite him in the ass. Right. Um, take my personal mail. No. <laughs> <laughs> Um, because he goes on an extended trip to check out what's going on with Lend Lease and, and, and check out what's going on with our allies efforts in the Soviet Union and in China. Okay. Okay. In the middle of World War II. Yeah. We loved the Soviet Union. Sure. And we loved China. Sure. They were both fighting against um, the Axis and they were fighting against Japan. And, I mean, Japan was so terrible in China. Right. And, I mean, did horrible, horrific things. And, I mean, and Stalin, evil, evil man. Mm-hmm. But he was fighting the Nazis. Sure. It's like enemy of my enemy kind of thing. Enemy of my enemy. That's exactly how we looked at it. Yeah. And before the mid-40s, that's how everybody looked at it. I mean, even Churchill, who hated Stalin with, an, with a deep, burning passion, sure. was like, we got we to gotta work with this guy. Uh-huh. And so he took a photo tour. You know, back before um, Instagram and TikTok pictures could blow up on you, mm-hmm. he took a whole bunch of pictures at... Soviet collectives and and playing with like cows in in Chinese rice patties and things like that. It's okay right now because they were our friends. Uh-huh. Not good photo evidence. Sure. So anyway, in 1944, as we all know, FDR died. Yeah. But. Before that, he had to win his fourth presidential term mm-hmm. in 1944. Yeah. Which is, you know, again, highly unusual. Middle of war, going to happen. Mm-hmm. Everybody assumed that Henry would be uh, the vice president. Right. But at the nominating convention, mm-hmm. which FDR was too old or ill to go to. Yeah. Um, a bunch of mainstream Democrats are like, um, no, 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 we don't want, we don't want him. We don't want him. Interesting. He's, he sat up, um, but, but Henry's like, well, I can talk to him. Mm-hmm. So he got up and made a speech. How about go? He said, the future belongs to those who go down the line unswervingly for the liberal principles of both political and economic democracy, regardless of race, color, or religion. In a political, educational, and economic sense, there must be no inferior races. The future must bring equal wages for equal work, regardless of sex or race. This is 1944. Yeah, but they didn't like that then. No, <laughs> they didn't like that. Right. So, like, the first ballot, it was too close to call, and then the second ballot for vice president, Harry Truman. Yeah. I mean, Harry Truman's not bad. Mm-hmm. He was not human. Sure. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> missed opportunity. <laughs> missed opportunity. So much of a missed opportunity. Right. Um, I mean, it would have been, it would have been kind of like getting Bernie. Yeah. Because um, he was like, he was not what you would call a delight in like a silver tongue devil. Mm-hmm. 
They say he's got like this shock of big white hair, which I mean, he kind of looks like Spencer Tracy okay. in one of the old Spencer Tracy, Catherine Hepburn movies. Mm-hmm. But they said that he looks like a hayseed, talks like a prophet, and acts like an embarrassed schoolboy. Wow. <laughs> Scathing review. Yeah. And and Democrat. <laughs> yeah, he was, you know, he said no matter what he does, it's always going to seem faintly ridiculous. No matter how he acts, it's always going to seem faintly pathetic. Wow. That's kind of how they described him because he was not exactly, I mean, he could write. His books are awesome. Mm-hmm. But when he got out, like, hanging out with people. Yeah. He was so much better if he was, like, talking to you, like, out on the farm and things like that. He wasn't a public speaker. He was not a public speaker. Mm -hmm. And so, then he does one more thing. Okay. Uh, Of course, you know, FDR dies. Truman becomes president. Yeah. Um, One sec. I just want to check the time. They move him over to Secretary of Commerce. Mm Mm-hmm. Not really his deal, yeah. but they don't really, you know, they're trying to edge him, ease, out. edge him out. And so he, after the war, everybody's like, oh my God, the Soviet Union, yeah. you know, now we're going to have to fight them. Right. And the Cold War starts. Those pictures. And Henry makes a statement yeah. where he says, okay, we all know that the Soviet Union is going to get the bomb, mm-hmm. you know, going to get the technology for the bomb. I think we ought to just go ahead and give it to them. <laughs> and that way we can all work together to ensure that there's peace for everybody. What an interesting take. <laughs> huh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. How'd that go over? <laughs> <laughs> Not so much. Shocking. You know, uh, basically, Hugh Ack and the, or like, oh my God, he's a commie, he's a commie. Yeah. You know, he, when, and when Vietnam started, he had to do a mea culpa and say, you know, I must have been crazy. Or yeah. actually, it was Korea. He was like, I must have been crazy. I was, you know, thinking that they were, you know, just good people. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that, as he's edged out of office and he becomes like editor of the new Republic and stuff like that. And then in 1948, he's like, somebody has got to go up against the cold war. So he runs as an independent for president. Okay. I think he got like less than 1% of the vote, like statistically completely insignificant. Yeah. But there's like all these pictures of him with like unions and with like, I mean, this is where I start thinking like Bernie. Sure. Cause he's just, he's got this, I believe, you know, if we all work together, we can do this amazing thing. And so then he goes down, you know, and and professors and writes and edits and things like that. And I think 1961, he's diagnosed with ALS. Okay. And being Henry. Yeah. He documents all of it. Wow. He writes it down as he's, you know, his symptoms get so, so that doctors can maybe use it to help. That's other people i mean he's That's just very kind yeah i mean he's just as um, constantly thinking of constantly others. thinking of others constantly yeah. i mean he's curious mm-hmm. um there's uh lorraine hansberry yeah the lady who wrote um a raisin in the sun okay said that children see things very well sometimes an idealist even better okay and I, I sort of think of him like that. Him. Yeah, he's just, he has this vision that's so pure, pure that's just, it's beautiful to, to like read his stuff and yeah. things like that. In fact, one of, um, I'll stop my part of the talking and you can tell me <laughs> any questions you have. But um, one of the things, when he was first Secretary of Agriculture, mm-hmm. Somebody came up to him at a big Washington to do mm-hmm. and was like, What's the one quality that you think is important for a man to have in plant breeding work? Because, of course, we're sexist. Sure. Uh, but, um, and he goes, Sympathy for the plant. Oh, I like that. Yeah, I mean, and by the, I mean, he didn't mean just like some, you know. No, like that. I mean, actually... of course, sympathy for the devil plays in my head when I say, <laughs> but, but he means it like, 
you know, that it's like this, that whole thing of you and the plant and nature are all in communion. Right. And so you should be sympathetic to what's going, the nature around you. I like that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And so. That's very interesting. Okay. I have one question for you, but then we probably got to start wrapping it up. Okay. Um, And this is more of an opinion one. Um, What do you think was his, like, most impressive accomplishment? Because he sounds very, very accomplished, and he has a lot of, like, lasting to today kind of impacts. Oh, so, you like, know the music The music they play? Um, Ode to the Common Man, the one that they play? That's based off one of his books. Oh, wow. Okay. See? But, yeah, so it sounds like he has, like, a lot of reaches into, like, today's world. So what do you think mm-hmm. is the most impressive, like, personally? Well, his family started um, a nonprofit that helps democracy, okay, which I yeah. think is something that lasted from him. Uh-huh. But for him personally... Mm-hmm. Um, I, I really think that his notion of equality and, and like, you know, pushing even foreign companies to Mm -hmm. say, okay, we're going to treat workers with fairly is probably one of the, um, biggest and the, the creation. I mean, I say this looking at some of the recent, um, sec ags and yeah um yeah but his l- creation there yeah and his investment in the time and the energy to say okay the whole idea of domestic agriculture is more holistic uh-huh. than you know crops for sale it's about you know it's about the soil you plant the crops in it's about the environment that you create for them it's about the weather how it's affecting each other it's about soil replenishment and yeah. i i think probably that would be his most lasting legacy okay which is you know that fits with the whole wallaces of iowa sure <laughs> but, um and just real quick could you speak a little bit more about the nonprofit that his family made his nonprofit, um, the nonprofit that his family made, has um, like political ensuring democracy in the world. Yeah. They have a law um, section that works for, you know, going out and fighting for um, people's rights. Oh, very cool! Yeah. And then um, I think there's a couple of other sections. I think an yeah. economic one, and um, you know, like a statistical service to track information. Yeah, but it just no, it's very cool, yeah. Yeah. I love that. Alrighty, well, um... Okay, also, thank you for letting me ramble about Henry Agard Wallace. Henry Agard Wallace. Yes. Silly little name. <laughs> His very wife's cool name was Ilo. I'd still cooler than Agard. Yeah. Like, <laughs> um, alrighty, well, now it's time to talk about what rained on our parades, but I do think um, that because of, like, how inspiring he is and his, like, seemingly very optimistic attitude, we should do, like, the sunny things. Absolutely. Yeah, so what was sunny for you? Well, recently, recently, uh, well, I took my my first daffodil of spring picture and posted my um, uh, Wordsworth poem with it, which Mm I do every year. Of course, yeah. And... I learned how to make a London Fog latte. They're very tasty. Um, yeah, very into that too. <laughs> definitely a sunny spot for me. Um, they're really tasty. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you said they were like pretty simple, right? Like they weren't like crazy hard to... It's Earl Grey tea, mm-hmm. simple syrup, and foamed milk. Yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, I think for me... Um, I've been, like, crocheting a lot recently, um, and I made one of those things on TikTok where it's, like, a reversible octopus, where it's, like, happy on one side and sad on the other side. It is very cool. I was very proud of it. Um, and then... You uh, made a dress. I talked about that, though. Oh, you already talked about that, yeah. Yeah. I'm still proud of it. Yeah, I say, well, I kind of see you model it the other day. Yeah, I, like, wore it out and everything, and I was like, I made this. (laughs) 
I didn't tell that to anyone. Um, you like didn't I was, just go like, to random, random people. people. Yeah. <laughs> but it was like in my head. I was like, yeah, that's right. I did this. Um, but yeah. Um, also, um, I truly, I, I think the, the West Side Story, like, it was, was beautiful. So much it was fun. really well done. I mean, I think we both were in like, like awe afterwards. awe afterwards. Yeah, I mean, we couldn't even, you know, it took us like a few minutes to, to, to be able to talk about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I love Steven Spielberg. It's mm-hmm. really nice to see that he hasn't lost his touch because I think, yeah. like, it's he makes perfectly. magic. He's, he he's, really does. I mean, back in the, you know, before everybody had a dark side mm-hmm. and, you know, they, there was like a story online about the dark side of whoever. Right. Um, he was he was just considered magic and and when i was a kid i mean he still is i think he is yeah absolutely um beautiful movie highly recommend it um and he's a director that you can watch and be like that's a beautiful movie and then afterwards go yeah of course it was steven spielberg it's not like every single cut is Oh, that's a Steven Spielberg cut. Yeah, we talked about the, this. Uh, yeah. Like, like, so he's a classic director, mm-hmm. and then you also have like Tarantino, who's a very popular director. Right. And so it's like when you're watching a Tarantino movie, absolutely no moment can pass without knowing that it's a Tarantino. Exactly. Movie. Um, but like Spielberg, the suspension of disbelief for it is so much larger because he really engrosses you in the film. Um, mm-hmm. I agree with that. Which is wonderful. Yes. Uh, he's a great guy. I mean, it's like you've been somewhere. I think if we'd seen that in the theater, I think I'd I'd basically float out of there. I know. That's I, one that I'm, like, so sad that we, like, couldn't see in theaters. Because mm-hmm. I do feel like it would just be, like, even Magic. better. Yeah. yeah. Um. So watch West Side Story. Yes. And um, learn, learn more. more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Learn more about Henry and... There's some other forgotten people that we could mention sometime. Yeah, we'll talk more about some other guys at some point. And women. Yeah. Have a good one. <laughs> Have a sunny Wednesday. <laughs> Bye. Bye.